the considered, it is currently considered the least restrictive environment. So if you have a severely handicapped child, they would be in a self-contained class. So this is all about, okay, this is not like having children with Down syndrome. No, I'm talking about kids have learning disabilities, emotional behavioral disorders, and um, other health impairments like attention deficit, hyperactivity. So I think you're getting feedback about something that would either go up top or maybe on a cover letter, mm -hmm. you know, where you're doing your invitation to participate, and that would be a little uh, richer description of what you mean by inclusion. And, okay. Yeah, and I would, in question number... See, most everybody at my school knows exactly what it is. So it might not be an issue. See, at, at my school, everybody knows what inclusion is. And question number three, I guess, what you were talking about, do you feel that that inclusion is better? How about we make comments? Because that could be. Yeah, well, because you got to give a chance for each person to respond on each area. No, no, I think this, like, for example, if I am a science teacher, okay, then I would answer, yes, I feel they would be better at self-contained, uh, a resource science class or math or whatever. I mean, I know a lot of the math teachers would answer that they would feel they, they would be better in a special ed classroom for math. Are you, okay, these inclusion kids, are they always have a teacher of special ed? Are, well, depends on their IEP. Yeah. Like for example, do, 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 do you think yeah. every, what I do as what I do as an oh, okay. what I feel as an inclusion is. teacher is I try to make the job of the it's regular ed teacher easier. Mm -hmm. That that's is my job is to do is to make it so she wants sure but he wants me there because I'm helping them with that job. But see, so we, that, that's a big part of it. So do you have anything, questions like that? Like yeah, you, yeah, there's lots of questions like that. Like number 11 is, um, no, number 10. Number 12, I feel that I have a great, y'all want me to read some of these? Y'all, I have a better, no, I have a greater enjoyment of teaching because of inclusion. I feel that having another adult in the classroom is an asset. That's what you were talking about, number 13. So a teacher, and I'll, I'll, be, I'll be honest, the main reason I changed from what I was going to do to this is because this is something I'm passionate about because at my school it is a pendulum. Either teachers love doing inclusion or they hate it. And as an inclusion teacher, when I go into a classroom of a teacher who loves it, I can tell an immediate difference than a teacher who hates it. And there are teachers that hate you helping them because they want to be in control of everything in their classroom. And they don't want you signing agendas, and they don't want you doing this because it's their classroom. So, so when you find the answers to these, I mean, when you find the answers not to this, but to your research, mm -hmm. what uh, what do you do with that? Well, I probably would talk to our administrator about it, maybe. But I think no, the most the important thing. Oh, I mean, no, you know, I mean, I think our administrator knows. I think he tries. Okay. I think they try really hard when they schedule to allow for people who work well together to stay together. I mean, I, I really feel like they do that. But I do think that the survey in itself can help teachers do some self-reflecting. Like, there are teachers who don't know that they have bad attitudes toward in inclusion, but once they do the survey, they'll be like, oh, maybe I, I, am, I have been kind of snotty about this. You know, I mean. So I think that when they do the survey, it'll it'll serve a couple of different purposes. They'll do some self-reflection and self-assessment as they're doing the survey. You know, they'll be asking these questions, thinking, "Well, how do I feel about this? Do I think that Randy is helpful in my classroom?" Well, yeah, he is. And they may come to the realization that, "Hey, my inclusion teacher does help out, and I don't really show appreciation to them like I should." Now, that's just a rare occasion that I've had. That most of the teachers I work with are fabulous. Well, one but I've been doing this for like one long lady time. that works at my school. She's getting her doctorate and her thesis on how um, having students in an inclusion environment decreases their IQ. That's what she's doing. Students that are not special ed. Students that are not special ed, if they're in an inclusion classroom, their IQ is going to See, I don't agree with that. No, oh, I, I think boring. that's like a slap in the face. It really that. is. Oh, well, I've had a teacher tell me this year, when asked how we wanted to do our CRC ramp up, how we want to divide the kids, I said, well, research shows that the, the special ed kids should be included with whatever groups 
that you do. And the teacher said, I don't care what the research says. I want you to take them to somewhere else so I can focus on the other kids. Yeah. <laughs> the, only, the only problem I see, I, I think this is great, by the way. I'm, not, I'm saying the only problem I see, I'm just speaking on this, but like in regards to special education, is when they did away with the resource setting in high school and kids had to choose between Two diploma options. Two, two diploma options, mm -hmm. but they've got, mm -hmm. they're either self-contained or they're inclusion, but there are those kids that are in between, mm -hmm. and they're not self-contained, but they're not quite inclusion. I, now, yes. those students, I see where some of the inclusion teachers have. And those oh, students oh, are I also have two like that school. this year. I have two right. like that this year in eighth grade that but probably I, will not graduate. But I can see teachers what reading this teaching? and hammering it away thinking of those students Absolutely. and not the ones who make, you know, I don't know. Well, I agree. And that's why the survey is good, too. I think yeah. it lets the teachers voice their opinions about some of those <coughs> issues. I mean, 15 years ago, I had a group of seventh graders in an inclusion math class, and none of them knew basic facts. 15 years ago, I could go in and call all their parents and say, you know what, they're not getting this, it's too high level for them, I'd like to create a resource class for your kids. And I was able to have IEP meetings, and, and I, as a teacher, had the authority to create a, a resource class. This was 15 years ago, though. You know, I mean, it's different now. I mean, we, and it we have depends on less, the age level you work in. Yeah. In the elementary school, there is still a resource, and that's what the majority yeah. of the children get in their guided mm -hmm. instruction, with their grade level instruction. We don't have yeah. that in the classroom. Mm -hmm. I see this as being a big opportunity to work with your administration and your faculty to maybe address a challenge of serving every school in the every student in the school to the maximum capacity of that school. And uh, and maybe collecting the data and reporting it out is just the first step. And I think for me personally, and I don't know if anyone else is like this in the room, it's easier to remember the bad stuff. And maybe teachers at my school have a better attitude toward inclusion than I even realize. Because I only think about that one teacher who was ugly about, oh my gosh, I've got your kids. I've got to deal with your kids this year. I mean, that that's the kind of stuff I remember, but... Well, they've got to deal with her. That's what I would just Well, they've got to deal with you. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, so this is, this is something that can be a good thing, because I'll find out that a lot of the teachers in my school really do have good attitudes about inclusion, you know. I think it also you don't have um, <clears throat> there's a couple of things that we'll want to review. Um, this is an issue that comes up with almost any survey that is supposed to be anonymous. Uh, how many teachers are at your school? A lot. Um, Hundreds? Maybe, yeah. Okay. Um, by the time you start breaking that down into the teachers with specialist degrees who are also special education teacher and she's between 11 and 15 years of experience. Oh, I'm going to know who it is. Yeah. Oh. But still, when I collect the data, it'll, it'll be like all of them together. You know, should I eliminate the male and female part of it? Before you ask a background demographic question, uh -huh. you need to have a good um, rationale for asking it. It uh, needs to be emerging out of the literature. In other words, if the literature is suggesting that there are prominent, meaningful, uh, important differences between male and female teachers, then ask. Otherwise, don't ask. Um, my guess is, and this is something you have to look for in the literature also, what difference does years of experience make 
on teacher attitudes, or for that matter, on almost anything else that has to do with teaching. Study this a little bit, because I can't give you a definitive answer right now. My feeling is that the most prominent differences for years of experience occur within years one, two, and four. Mm -hmm. And that after that, I'm not saying that there aren't differences between year five and year 15. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying that my guess is, my gut feeling is, there's less difference between year five and 15 than there is between one and two. Okay, so I can have broader. I would have broader categories. Like one to 10 years. No. Uh, <laughs> one to I mean, one to if, if, if I felt, one now this is, one. if I felt that years of experience was really important, I would have the first category be new teachers, new. Now what, I don't know, what do you call new? How many years? Within five years. Uh, I think new is is at least less than for person. And um, and then only have at the most three categories of experience. At the most, we're talking about new, early career, and everybody else. Does she really need to know special ed versus regular ed? Yes. Yeah, they're, they're probably yeah. Yeah. What about masters? Well, I wanted to see if, like, for example, if a teacher just has their bachelor's degree, are all the teachers that have their bachelor's have negative attitudes and all the ones that have their specialists have positive attitudes because they're more educated about it? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's not necessarily true. There may not be a correlation, but that's what I'm, I'm hoping that the more educated teachers are more positive toward inclusion because they read the research that it is a good thing. It's a good theory. I mean, it's a good theory, and it's a good thing to be able to check for if you feel like there's a way that it could be done, and teachers will still be honest with you. Maybe I could do bachelor's or graduate or more, and that would be one, one of them. There you go. I mean, these are, there's no right or wrong answers to these. It's just things to think through. Do you think, how about an open-ended question? Like at the end for them to share their comments? Or what would you do tomorrow if you had an inclusion class? You know, how would that, you know, something like that. Something like, would you be, would explain why or why not you'd be willing to have an inclusion classroom? Something like that. So an open-ended question where they can share their comments? Just so you can understand them better. Yeah. Okay. I think that's a reasonable possibility. What are your, you know, what are your comments about All right, thank y'all. <laughs>
Because of the reading deficit of students, achievement gaps are getting wider and wider. To address this issue, many programs have been created and used by school districts. Um, also, uh, I found with the Florida Center for Reading Research uh, that they identify struggling readers and implemented the Thinking Reader Program in their school, which is a computer-assisted uh, program to help with the uh, reading. But they use it in their middle schools. And, um, our district is using Read 180. Um, that's, right, that's um, it's being used in um, Oak Elementary, which is our school. We're a Title One school uh, in the fourth and fifth grade, uh, the middle school and the high school. And uh, as Emily said, um, it's used in the uh, Title One schools. Um, the data will be collected to help determine if the Read 180 program has helped, will ha has helped to improve the achievement gap, gap in reading in the elementary school. Um, I have several questions that I'm going to attempt to answer. Um, what is the effect of the Read 180 program on student achievement in the elementary schools? 
Um, in the research that I found, most of them that use the programs uh, that are similar to the Read 180, they start in the middle schools. And I think um, it's interesting that we have it in the fourth and fifth grade, so that's going to be um, interesting for us. How would the CRC <laughs> reading scores on the fourth graders without the Read 180 program compared to the fourth graders um, that had the Read 180 program? Same thing with the fifth graders. Um, will the fourth grade students do better on the SRI, which is a part of the Read 180 program? Um, it's an assessment piece that they take at the beginning of school and they also take it four times a year. Um, and we're going to see if that they, if it's increased by the time they take the post test and uh, also to determine which grade showed the most improvement. This is just um, telling you about the Read 180 program. Uh, it's a comprehensive system for raising reading achievement in struggling readers. Um, it has features um, that, in, uh, that increase the student engagement, teacher effectiveness, and empower leaders to support change in the district. It has four components. Um, the teacher um, will first teach a whole group lesson. Uh, once they teach the whole group lesson, which is about 20 minutes, then they, um, the students are divided up into groups already. From the assessment that they took on the computer, it's going to divide them up into groups automatically. So the teacher doesn't have to do that. And once they get all those components, we, we have a rotation, rotating system where uh, one group will go to the computer, one group will go to the independent center where they actually read books on their level, and then the small group will come with the teacher. And that's usually anywhere from three to five students. Um, they recommend 90-minute segments. Of course, the elementary do not operate on 90 minutes, so we actually have to do ours in two days. And so um, they have to spend a minimum of uh, 15 minutes, but um, they started off as 20 minutes, but when we found out that we were not able to get everything in, they said we can at least do 15 minutes. They have to at least be on the computer for 15 minutes or it will flag them. And we, like I said, we do it in two days. And so what they do the first time, say it's Monday, and I'm teaching whole group, uh, I do the 20 minutes and then they rotate to the different groups. And well, the second day, I won't do whole group at all. They'll automatically go to their center. So that's how we get the time in next slide. Um, the students receive um, what is called our book. That's their workbook that they use. Um, they have all different types of activities in that book. At the computer center, they have to go to, through the four zones. Um, the computer actually talks to them and actually reads to them. They get to read back um, uh, in the computer. We have to have the headphones with the microphones. Also, um, they have to start in the reading zone. And they love to go to the spelling zone, which is the word zone. And so we have to monitor that because they can't just stay in that particular zone. And they um, begin to get excited when they got to the success zone. And then they have a person on there that cheers them on as they go to the next uh, zone. And then they have a, a writing zone. They actually have to write about um, a different things. In, well, let me back up. They actually take a test where they, break, they have three groups that they interest groups, whatever they're interested in. So when they're doing their reading or whatever, it's, those lessons are going to be based upon how the, the groups that they chose, what interest levels or books that they chose. Um, we, also, we also have audio books on CD that they can actually listen, listen to. This year, when we, um, this was our first year implementing it in. So I actually, we had some students that didn't qualify, well, they, their level was too low to read any of the books. So we had to come up with uh, something else for them to do. So we ended up getting them AR books to read. So they, that's what they did in their independent center. But we also have books on tape, but it's on grade level that they can uh, not take the CDs now. Tapes anymore. Um, like I said, the paperbacks, are, they are high interest and um, <coughs> the kids seem to love um, some of the books. The e reads is actually a, uh, a program where they can actually um, do it at home. It's not the same stories that they use at school, but it's on their interest level, and they can actually uh, actually take tests and everything at home uh, on the e reads The SRI is uh, one of the pieces that I'm going to use. That's one of the tests that they use at the beginning to place them in the different groups. Um, 
They have the, um, after we do each workshop, there's an art skills test, and each story or lesson takes about um, two months to get through because of our not being able to do 90 minutes. So it does take us longer to get through things, but it's so interactive that it's, it doesn't, um, it's not boring to the kids. Um, and then they also have, what, in the independent center, the books that I was talking about, they actually have to take quizzes on those, just like um, when you do AR. And then for the teacher part, what is awesome, we have, of course, the teacher's edition. Um, the, uh, the anchor video, the DVD, um, that's the video that you, it's probably like a five minute video in three to five minutes. And it actually is um, very interactive or very, um, for instance, we did smoke jumpers. So they gave us a um, um, uh, video about what smoke jumpers are, what they do, and everything like that. And that helps to pique their interest about um, the story that um, they're about to read and everything like that. Um, the teacher dashboard is awesome. That's where all your data is um, stored. Um, every time the child goes to the computer, it is it computerizes everything they do. So at the end of the class, you're going to know if they spend enough time in each center. You're going to also know what they made in each center. It's going to regroup them to say that they need help in main idea, but it might not be the same group they were in at first. So it does all this on its own. Um, so you get a lot of data. You get information that you can actually give to the uh, homeroom teacher to let you, let them know what they're weekend. Um, only piece that the Read 180 doesn't have is the phonics piece, but that we found out that's a whole different set. So you have that's a whole different uh, ball game, which we, I wish we could afford it, but it's very very expensive. Um, the uh, its program that's for the teachers. Um, you have a website where you can go in and uh, if you have questions or whatever, it can uh, help you in that area. Um, the whole program is data driven. That's the SAM, that's where you get all the reports that you uh, use with the students. Um, actually, it's for the teachers and also the principals if they need um, any kind of reports or anything like that. Um, and also, there's actually a professional development that you can actually use on the computer with this uh, particular program. The participants that I'm going to use are the fourth and fifth grade. Um, the, uh, I have the fourth, fourth and fifth grade this year. And the fourth graders um, will actually be, well, my third graders will actually be fourth graders next year. And then um, the fifth grade, the fourth graders will be the fifth graders. So I will use those students' um, information. Uh, I will need to get approval from the county uh, to do this um, research. And I also will need to get a consent form from the parents in order to use the data. Um, also, the data that I'm going to use will be the 2011 and 2012 CRCT, CRCT <coughs> scores for the fourth and the fifth graders. Um, and also, I will use the data from the Read 180 program. Um, I'm be finishing. Yeah. Time. Uh, I'm going to start in May because we should have our CRCT <coughs> test back by then. And it will go through August. Um, Right, so I'll have my data for 2012. I already have the 2011 data, but I'll have the 2012 data again. And I will use charts, graphs, and the spreadsheets, the T chart. Yeah, T chart. Yeah, T chart. That's right. Yes. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, unfortunately, no coach. Um, He's a great guy. He's a little bit I didn't realize how good I had Right, that's why I'm to the I'm going to 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 to the I